Welcome to part four of the series, The Abrahamic Promises as a Foundation for the Gospel of the Kingdom. In the first three installments, we established what the three main promises were that God made to Abraham, the promise of land, the promise of descendants, and the promise of blessing to all nations. It is crucial to reiterate that the promise of land referred to real, tangible land on earth, known as Canaan. The promise of descendants pertained to actual offspring who would share a genetic connection with Abraham. The third promise, on the other hand, became more specific and focused on a solitary individual, namely Jesus. This aspect of the promise did not seem as obvious at first and had to be clarified by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. In this segment, and more installments to follow, we will begin to explore how all three promises find their fulfillment in the person of Christ Jesus. We will demonstrate that without Jesus, his actions, death, and resurrection, none of these promises could ultimately come to fruition. When Jesus began his public ministry, we see according to Mark 1.15 that he preached, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. It must be emphasized that Jesus did not simply preach about the gospel. He preached about the gospel of the kingdom of God. The two simply cannot be separated from each other. An illustration of this concept can be found in Matthew 4.23, where it is stated, And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. It should be evident that good news refers to a message and is not the message itself. Once we recognize what the good news pertains to, the kingdom of God, it's essential to always bear in mind that when we hear the term gospel, it is an abbreviation for the gospel or good news of the kingdom of God. But how can we derive a message concerning the kingdom of God from the Abrahamic promises? To address this question, it's necessary to begin by examining information about the kingdom of God, drawing from both New Testament accounts and Old Testament accounts. Once this foundation is established, the puzzle pieces will align. In summary, in accordance with the promise of land, possession, and ownership, the nation of Israel represented the kingdom of God during its period of influence. When the Hebrew people were granted entry into and ownership of the promised land, they formed a nation governed as a theocracy, governed by God. They did not at first have a king or ruler other than God, who had established his laws through Moses. While Israel did have leaders such as the judges, the ultimate authority rested with God and the set of laws he had already given through Moses. Later, the people demanded to have a king so they would be like all the other nations around them. This was not pleasing to God, but he did grant the request. This request was no surprise to the Creator, for it was his plan that through a specific king, David, the Messiah, would come. In 1 Samuel 8-7, God told the prophet Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Even though Israel eventually had kings, starting with Saul, it did not negate the fact that Israel remained the kingdom of God and continued to function more or less as a theocracy. It's true that having kings introduced other challenges and complicated the direct relationship between God and the people. However, during their periods of nationhood, the descendants of the patriarch Abraham still possessed the promised land. So long as they remained faithful, Israel stood as the only nation in the world devoted to the worship of the one true God. They adhered to the law of Moses, which governed their way of life, including matters related to worship, crime, sin, punishment, and morality. Israel's occupation of the land, nevertheless, was never permanent. Over the centuries, Israel struggled to maintain their allegiance to Yahweh God and often embraced the worship of the gods worshipped by the neighboring nations. They would neglect to instruct, observe, and abide by the law of Moses, ultimately becoming indistinguishable from any other nation in the world. 
As we discussed in the second installment of this series, many of these periods of disobedience and disloyalty resulted in numerous conflicts and defeats for Israel. The Israelite people were even taken into exile on a few occasions, being forced to leave their homeland and settled far away. But hopeful prophecies were made about Israel, such as is found in 1 Chronicles 17.9, which promised, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and no longer be disturbed, and wicked men will no longer wear them down as before. Yet even in modern times, with the nation of Israel firmly established, we are far from seeing this promise fulfilled. What makes this prophecy particularly intriguing is that it was given by God to his servant David, who held the position of the second king of Israel. It was David about whom God proclaimed that he was a man after my own heart, as recorded in 1 Samuel 13.14. The Apostle Paul, in one of his renowned sermons, also made a statement regarding David, affirming, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart, who will do all my will, as documented in Acts 13.22. In the next verse, verse 23, Paul continued, Of this man's offspring, God has brought a Savior to Israel, Jesus, just as he promised. Here, instead of linking Abraham with Jesus, Paul linked David with him. Paul was not alone in making this connection. The opening chapter of Matthew in chapter 1, verse 1, establishes the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Luke 3, 23 through 38 also makes this connection through its genealogy record. It seemed to be important to show that Jesus was a true descendant of both Abraham and David. Why could this be? It was said of David in 2 Samuel 7:16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Yet we do not see any descendants of David sitting on the throne in Israel today, do we? When Mary, the mother of Jesus, was first informed she had been chosen to bear the Messiah, she was told something very interesting by the visiting angel. She was told at Luke 131 through 33, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, we can grasp the profound significance of knowing that Jesus was indeed a genuine descendant of King David. God had pledged that the throne of David would endure eternally. This didn't imply that David himself would occupy the throne for all time, but rather the continuity of David's throne signified that there would always be a descendant of David who would hold that position, signifying a royal succession. The ultimate realization of the promise made to David, that his throne would be established forever, would be in Jesus. In Psalm 132, 11-12 we read, Yahweh swore in truth to David from which he will not turn back. One from the fruit of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. In the immediate context of this, we know David's son Solomon was in view. However, in the larger scheme of things, we know these words have distant future implications. As we continue reading in Psalm 132 verses 13 and 14, we see something that can only be yet future. For Yahweh has chosen Zion, and he has desired it to be his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. We again see the word forever used. God's desire is to personally dwell in Zion, and he intends to do so forever. As we continue reading in this psalm, we begin to see a picture of something quite marvelous, and again, the connection between David and Jesus is made in verses 15 through 18 still speak of Zion. God says, I will abundantly bless her provisions and I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation and her faithful will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. As we conclude this installment, let's make a few contextual connections between these verses in Psalm 132 and other passages which speak more specifically about Jesus.
We've already noted Luke 131 through 33 that Jesus would be given the throne of his father David. Psalm 132.17 speaks of a horn that would sprout for David. In Luke 168 through 71, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, said this about Jesus, whom his son, John, would introduce to the world. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. We see then how Psalm 132 was a foretelling of Jesus, a descendant of David. Currently, there are no kings on David's throne in Jerusalem. There were no kings on David's throne when Jesus walked the earth. Yet Jesus preached in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What did he mean by the time being fulfilled and the kingdom of God being at hand? or is drawing near. Thanks for listening. In our next installment, we'll look into those very questions. How will it come about that Jesus will sit on the throne of David, and where will that be? When will it be?